Thank you. Well, first and foremost, uh, this is a big week in our household. So um, uh, Maddie goes to sixth grade. Eli goes in the third. Callis starts kindergarten this year, which means no more daycare payments. So, <laughs> amen. Uh, but most importantly, uh, college football season kicks off. So I got to make sure that I'm representing the Gators here. <laughs> Put that right in front of Leah and Josh here just to make sure that their stomach's upset the entire time. Um, first and foremost, uh, say again. Yeah, you are. Thank God. <laughs> Go Gators. Um, first and foremost, an apology. Uh, by the end of this, you're probably going to roast me, want to roast me on a spit because you're going to be so hungry. Uh, that's because we're going to be focused on the banquet table, as you can see the picture here. Um, and since I like food, obviously, uh, I'm going to talk about food, or at least use food as the, the way for us to talk about this. Uh, as Joss mentioned, when we were going through the Everything on the Table series, I felt like you know, I kept hearing uh, there was a need to answer a few questions about a literal banquet table, right? This included, what does the father's table look like? What would we expect to eat or experience at his table? And then how do I get the invitation? First of all, anybody got a cell phone handy? All right, first person, look up the definition of communion and read the top definition, not the second definition. Just Google it. Well, I know some of us use it as a Bible, so. Exactly. So Brent mentioned this earlier when, about being in communion. Uh, we talked about it. Uh, Josh mentioned it. Uh, you know, being in communion is a process. It's not just the act of taking communion at the table. There's a reason we call that the communion table. It's because we get to share in the intimacy. And we're going to talk about kind of intimacy in dining with the Father, right? Now, a little background. When I was in college, I worked in a lot of kitchens. I probably had every job in the restaurant industry from bus boy and dish boy all the way up to general manager and uh, head chef. Um, I was a corporate trainer for Red Robin and Cheesecake Factory. I used to open restaurants for them. I later became the sous chef for the executive chef of the Ritz Carlton in St. Louis. Um, so food is a big part of who I am. And my wife, God bless her, bless her heart. When she cooks, we have a saying, she tries her hardest. When she cooks, we, <laughs> when she cooks, we eat, but when I cook, we eat well. <laughs> I would say that one of my spiritual gifts is hospitality, which I inher inherited from my parents. And we're regularly hosting dinners, um, uh, you know, doing meal trains. Uh, we have two regular feasts that we hold at our house. One is the Feast of Seven Fishes, which is an Italian tradition. Um, for those who don't know, it, I, <laughs> <if I can. laughs> I'm not Italian, but I love the Italian tradition. I love the ability to share the story of the birth of Christ and going through uh, the importance of his life through the different courses. Um, and not everyone likes what's served, while Kristen and I love each of the courses, going from salt cod to lobster to everything in between. Uh, the kids eat fish sticks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. They, they don't want to try, they don't want the shrimp. No, absolutely not. We also host an annual after the 4th of July. Um, you can see there uh, is a pig that I did. Uh, whole hog. The first time I invited Josh, Leah, Jessica, and Jeremy over to our house was during one of these feasts. Um, I had the whole hog, all the trimmings. Unfortunately, that set quite a large precedent <laughs> for any time that I was going to invite them over after that. Needless to say, if you do get an invitation to eat at one of our house or one of our feasts, you will eat well as well. So what is a banquet? We'll go to the next slide here. Oh, by the way, those are all pictures of food. If you go to my Instagram, it's either kids, dogs, or food. Um, so what is a banquet? Wow, that text is really small on the screen. It's a large public meal or feast complete with main courses and desserts. Simple. Um, generally, they serve a purpose such as charitable gatherings, a ceremony, a celebration, often followed by speeches, or it's done in honor of a person. Um, they've been used as formal occasions for thousands of years, and kings during the medieval times usually threw banquets for special events like birthdays and holidays, usually their own birthdays and holidays. 
Um, business banquets are a popular way to strengthen bonds between businessmen and their partners. It's also common for a banquet to be organized at the end of an academic event, right? So all the, the people in uh, an academy of doctors, you know, specific types of doctors, like the Pediatric Association, when they get together, they have a big banquet at the end of it. Uh, it's, it's designed to gather a community together in fellowship around a common, uh, I don't want to say cause or goal, but at least some sort of common theme that they can all celebrate together. And in the Bible, we're given many examples of feasts. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that God loves food as much as I do. <laughs> um, when Abraham welcomes God, he lays out a feast. When Abraham later celebrates that Isaac is weaned, he hosts a feast. There are feasts of Abram and Lot, as well as many others throughout the book of Genesis. In fact, the entire book of Esther should be called the book of feasts. It starts, uh, it begins with two feasts. Later, uh, Esther is elevated at a feast. Her story hinges on a mini feast, and it ends in two additional feasts, one of which is called Purim today. And then there are seven major Old Testament feasts, and four of which are, are still celebrated. First is the Feast of Shelters in the Tabernacle, also known as Sukkot. Uh, it celebrates God's provision of his presence in the Ark of the Covenant and the sanctification of Israel. This feast also coincides with Solomon's consecration of the temple that Leah talked about a couple of weeks ago. There's Passover, signifying the redemption of Israel and, um, and Exodus from slavery, not to mention the passing over of the angel of death. Um, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which uh, signifies sanctification of Israel and God's provision in the desert. Shavuot, um, Shavuot, Shavuot. I'm, I'm not Jewish, but. <laughs> uh, Shavuot uh, recalls the giving of the law um, at Sinai, Mount Sinai 50 days after crossing the Red Sea and thankfulness for the Lord's bl blessing on the church uh, or, and the birth of the Old Testament church. Now, as Chris Christians, 50 days later, it's the establishment of his New Testament church. And does anyone know the common name? 50 days should give it away. Pentecost, right? <clears throat> the Feast of First Fruits signifying the resurrection of Israel as free people. And then in the New Testament, we also have, we have the wedding feast. We have the prodigal son where the father invites everyone uh, to feast the, uh, on the fatted calf when his son returns. Um, and then we have the parable of the great feast. I'm going to be reading here from Luke 14, 50 through 24. I was going to read from the, my Bible. I forgot my glasses. So I actually printed it here <laughs> in large 22 point font. <laughs> But we'll start with the, uh, verse 15. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it would be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with this story. You know, a man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When a banquet was ready, he sent a servant to tell the guest, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and I must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. And his master was furious and said, go quickly to the streets and the alleys and the towns and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. So his master said, go out to the country lanes, behind the hedges, urge anyone you can find so that the house would be full. For none of those that I first invited will even get the smallest taste at my banquet. Now, I often read this passage and I think about my receiving the invitation, if I were the one there. And my desire is, yes, I want to be invited to the Father's banquet table, but I would often feel unworthy Right? Would I be worthy to be at the Father's table, to be at his side, to be in the presence of his glory? But even in that mindset, I'm no different than the first people who received an invitation because I'm making an excuse. I'm not good enough. Why, why should I be there? I'm not good enough. It's because it hinges on my expectation of his glory and the opulence and what it might look like. So, Expectations. Hope, what I want to be served, reality. I get a Big Mac. If I was to accept his invitation, am I doing so with different expectations than what he would have? For example, 
do I, what do I expect to be served? I might say he's the king. He's glorious. He, he's the one that's going to have the most abundant stuff that I've never tasted, the, the creations of this earth and beyond, because he can create anything he wants. But what if it's not up to my expectations? I'm, I'm one of those people that always wants to know what's on the menu. Anybody else? Yeah, before you go out to dinner, you want to know what are my choices before I even choose that place. But what, what if it's a surprise? Some of the best meals I've ever had are the ones where I go to a restaurant, don't look at the menu, and tell the waiter to pick for me. Just they surprise me. Here's my allergies, which are none. <laughs> I like beef medium rare, as it should be. And um, I eat absolutely everything under the sun. Um, I recently, this is the part where you're all going to hate me because I'm going to tease you with an experience I had. I recently went to London for work and uh, Googled like must eat places in London. This is just the day before I came down with COVID um, while I was there. <clears throat> By the end of the dinner, my sinuses were clogged. Like I was hot, like, probably infected everybody at this restaurant. I had no idea. Um, I couldn't find anything. So I found the name of this place. It's called uh, the Monarch Theater Inside Park Row Restaurant. Now, Park Row, if anybody's a comic book fan, you might have heard of the Park Row or Monarch Theater before. All I could tell about this place is that it was themed on Batman. <coughs> uh, those walls there, by the way, are projector screens. So for uh, this is a 12-course tasting menu, and each course is themed on a different character from the Batman universe. <clears throat> um, so I, I went through everything. I went through uh, all the places to find anything I could about this. I found one write-up, and apparently there were pictures that were on this write-up, um, and they were turned blank uh, at the request of, like they took down the pictures at the request of the restaurant because they wanted to keep it so secret. So it's a 12-course tasting menu created by a Michelin star chef. Um, and upon arrival, uh, which will be the next slide, guests are given a two-faced coin that they can put in the old fortune, old school fortune telling machine. So two-face, there, there's your uh, Harvey Dent a reference. Um, and the, the clown would actually point to either dark or light. Are you dark hearted or light hearted? And you got one of two different cocktails to start the, the evening. The next course is actually the first food course. And once you're seated, the show begins. Uh, themed on the Riddler. Uh, this amuse bush, which means a little bite. Um, this amuse bush uh, is a hot ox tongue lollipop and a cold coronet of prawns and salmon roe. So it was two little small bites, single bites. Um, they were phenomenal. By the way, everything has its own wine pairing as well. I couldn't get the wine list from them. They won't share it. I emailed them. I begged. I'm like, they told us what it was. Can't, can't. They were like, you should have taken notes. Uh, the next course centers on the penguin's desire for opulence. Uh, this dainty tartare of scallop crowned with caviar and a sheet of gold leaf. And then on the bottom there is a Thai uh, coconut um, sauce with uh, a lemongrass. Um, the, the green part is the lemongrass uh, oil that's on there. Uh, then we highlight the scarecrow. This is an edible mushroom at, uh, parfait. It's served on a bed of foliage encased in a glass dome. The parfait was designed to resemble a toadstool ensnaring a rich, gloriously earthy parfait with a creamy texture meant to be spread upon a, bre uh, a toasted piece of brioche that they give you. Um, this, it, it, it's almost like a, the texture is like a pate, but the taste is just out of this world amazing. Um, the next course is highlights Dr. Harley Quinn. Um, so it delivers a martini glass filled with a hot crystal clear duck consomme. So it's a hot soup in this cup. You'd think it would be icy, but no, it's hot. So it's playing with the senses. Uh, rampart with lemongrass. Perched on top of it is the crispy duck uh, confit croquette, uh, as well as the, um, the in-season tomatoes and fresh fruit uh, or, or fresh uh, vegetables that came with it. Then we get, oh, so serious <coughs> with the Joker. Um, this is a tranche of black cod complemented with a miso puree, a soft charred octopus tentacle, all neatly arranged to look like a smiley face. 
naturally. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's the, the syringe there is a, um, it, it's almost like a blood sauce. You're supposed to design the plate however you want and, and make it your own. Uh, poison ivy appears next with a palate cleansing sorbet of cardamom, passion fruit, and pineapple served in a hollowed out coconut. And at this time, we'd actually taken a break. They told us to take a break during the meal. We all left the room. We come back in. There's like this whole forest on the table. And all of our uh, next courses are actually sitting in the forest, which is kind of cool. Um, my favorite course actually next was themed on Dr. Freeze serving a portion of smoked eel, a bone short rib, and the jewel of the dish's proverbial crown, a fried frog's leg armored with the finest breadcrumbs I think I've ever had. Um, it's also served with a really weird tong. You're supposed to eat everything with the tong instead of, they, they, they had, anytime they had a, a uh, uh, new course, they brought out new silver and new flatware. So the only thing you had was the tong. Eating with the tong is really weird. Um, it's weirder than, sh like, chopsticks are easy, but, like, there's something surgical about this. <laughs> <laughs> Always tempted to steal the show, Catwoman's creation was a piece of edible jewelry. It's actually down at the bottom there. Um, it, it's a um, pearl, uh, a Celerac whiskey and macadamia nut pearl. Um, and so it's it, a very, it, it was a ball about this big. Um, just smaller than a golf ball. You're supposed to be one bite kind of thing and the flavor just explodes in your mouth. Um, then it was time for the heroes to arrive. So the next one is actually Batman. Uh, this is a black glazed filet, um, uh, filet uh, alongside a truffled rock filled with silky mashed potatoes. So that rock is actually like a croquette, but it's a black and, and the creamy uh, uh, potatoes are in it. Um, and then our second DC superhero is Wonder Woman, delivering a punch of chocolate leaf dusted with gold served in a salted caramel ice cream plus de uh, a delicately, delicately spiced uh, hazelnuts. And then lastly, we float away with Superman. This is, again, the table changes. Um, they took away the forest, and um, there are magnets in this table um, so when they set everything down, they turn on the magnets, and the plates literally elevate off the table. <coughs> Fruits of the forest sorbet is served with a floating plate. Yes, a floating plate. And then it's served with a white chocolate souffle. The, you have the cold and the hot, and you're supposed to eat them together. It is just absolutely amazing. Anybody hungry yet? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to go with you. <laughs> <laughs> i got to say, for the uh, $250 per person ticket... It is the finest dining experience I've ever had. And I've been to tasting menus. I've eaten at Emeralds. I've eaten at other Michelin star restaurants. I've eaten all across the United States, uh, the, the French Laundry and, and other places. And this was the most elegant dinner and experience I've ever been to. I'm so glad I did it, regardless of how horrible I felt at the end of the night. Thank <laughs> you, COVID. While this sounds amazing, right? Not all banquets are this festive. So if I were to dine with the father, would I be expecting this or would I be expecting Chinese takeout? So here's some real questions just to sit on for a second. What if it's not what I expected? How often do I put my expe expectancy on the father, right? Our expectations of the father, our demands of that transaction between him and us are often the stumbling box, blocks by which we enter in. We often come to the table in prayer, right? And we expect amazing healings, but they don't come. Are we walked away? Do we walk away disappointed? We could hope for amazing gifts of jobs or anything else that we lift up in prayer, only to be left hungry for more. So coming to the table means that regardless of what's served, you leave that expectation at the door. You leave that baggage at the door. You leave the hopes and ev everything that is not of anything but accepting that invitation at the door and you walk in. Our expectations in accepting the invitation leave us disappointed. His desire, though, in the invitation is for the relationship that fills us. So what does that relationship look like? 
Relationship, um, the purpose of dining together isn't to feed us. It's about opening it up, being in communion, as we said earlier, being in the presence and sharing that intimacy with one another. Uh, Josh read um, earlier, you lay the banquet for me before my enemies. And I had a dream about what I called the surrender ba- banquet. And I, I know it's a dream because I, God, I searched forever to find out if this was absolutely true. And no, this didn't happen. But I dreamed of two warring parties coming together representing the Confederate and Union troops after the surrender of Appomattox. There, both the officers of, of both armies joined to break bread together at the banquet. And it had an important, two important takeaways for me in this dream. One, it signified the brotherhood and rejoining of forces and, and one nation and one heart. The second was a posture of surrender of the Confederate troop to come in and be a part of that, to be allowed at the table. They had to surrender and leave the baggage, leave everything behind, ignore the, the declarations of the Confederacy and say, I want to be at the table. I want to be accepted. Now, mind you, this is a dream. Didn't happen. I looked. I tried whatever I could to find that if, if that actually happened. Thank God I found out it was just a dream. But do we surrender when we come to the table? Or do I still come with my expectations? Do I come and say, I left everything, but I can go back to it? Right? Or do I say, I'm surrendering in this under your rule and reign, under your authority here? And I want to continue in that relationship. <clears throat> Got to tease you with the gator for a second. Uh, in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, reads this. In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meats. There, he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the, the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our Lord. We trusted him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Now, remember Isaiah's prophet, right? When he speaks the words of God, he does so with both a warning and and a promise from the Father. A promise from the Father. At that top of the mountain feast, we are all welcome to be in a relationship where he swallows up death forever. As the world crumbles down around us, around that table on the Temple Mount, that's the only thing that stands firm. But the world crashes down around that table, around where people are having fellowship in communion with the Father. But, and there is a but, and mine's pretty large, we're only welcomed as we surrender to him and his rule and reign. So, y'all get enough or are we thirsty for more? <laughs> Let's talk about fullness for a second. And I think this is important because fullness as we dine with the Father does not come in the meal, but in his presence and relationship. And yes, I ate too much. It was glorious. I, I thought about, use, if anybody's seen a Monty Python sketch, there was one years ago, or they were all years ago. There was one, <laughs> there was one where a guy was, went to a restaurant the most gluttonous person ever, and he's eating every 45-course tasting menu or something like that. And the guy, it's eating so much, it's like covering him. And at the very end, they're like, you know, the last one is just a little mint. It's just a thin mint. And he tastes it and he explodes. And 
And I thought about putting it up there, but I was like, no, we're not going to go with gluttony today. But yeah, the, the, this fat cat really does a thing. But do, do we get enough when we're uh, at the table? Or do we walk away from the table thirsty for more? Do we anticipate kind of like that old grandma, have you eaten enough? Like, do, do you need some more? Or here's some cake or, or here's some coffee or here's just completely forcing food down your stomach until you shoo the old lady away. When I had that tasting menu, I felt physically full, but I still told my colleague afterwards when she and I were walking, I said, hey, you want to go get a gelato? <laughs> and it's not because I wanted to eat more, but rather because the event and that whole experience and the relationship that was formed and those bond, the work bonds that were formed between people enjoying that experience, they were cemented and I wanted that to continue. I was really full, by the way. <laughs> Fullness comes not in a meal, but in his presence. And through his presence and relationship, we receive that anointing and are filled. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10. And I'll, I'll read this here. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you've tasted, uh, now that you've had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by his people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God has built in his spiritual temple. So what more? What's more? You are his holy priests. Through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that will please God. Now, when I, I go through, I, I, I would love to think that I would be that fat cat after dinner, right? That I've had so much, and yes, it was glorious. But if I'm remembering that glory, I'm not remembering what was served. I'm remembering that father that invited me, right? The, the sheer presence of God, I, I have to imagine, is just mind-blowing in the way that when we get to come in, we're shocked by just the room. You know, that table, at the, when I showed the monarch table, that was already set with wine glasses and a, a charger plate and, and a couple of forks, Seeing that or seeing a state dinner, right? Um, the tables are, are elaborate. But I wouldn't be shocked by the table. I'd be shocked by the glory of the father sitting at the, the head of the table as I walk into the room. And we could also all agree that Christ is seated at the position of honor, right? I mean, we, we already know that he's seated at the right hand of the father. But did you know that we have an equal right to that seat? We are co-heirs with Christ. We are equal to be in that room. My thought earlier of not being welcome at the table because I'm not worthy, he's made me worthy. He's made me allowed to sit on the left side or sit in his seat. He would gladly give up his seat for any one of us to sit next to the Father to enjoy the relationship that is and available through him. Through his blood, we are invited to that table not only as guests, but as co-heirs. Co but we have to surrender. We have to surrender our expectations to accept that invitation. In that surrender, we are welcomed into the relationship. And it's not a one-time experience, but one that we get to taste again and again and again. Now, I know I talked a lot about food and I, I, I ran through this a lot faster while well, I, told, I told you. Like, they're like, it looks like you got so much on the page, it's going to take so long. No, I, I know how fast I talk. <laughs> but I want us to, to think about the intimacy. And what is the stumbling block that allows me to be intimate with the Father? One of the best parts of vineyard worship that I... I love for the many, many years I've been a part of the vineyard is a focus on intimacy and what we get, that fullness we get out of being in communion with the Father, with the Spirit, right? This morning, I loved the worship set. Absolutely loved the set, even if 
lyrically it doesn't match because we're talking about real food versus the, the communion table, right? But the, the fact of that moment of intimacy that we had, I felt like I was standing at the table. I felt like I was being fed the richest foods imaginable. I felt like I was able to have that, that one little, eat every time somebody comes up here and provides a, a, a word is a little palate cleanser for the next course. And I want to experience that day in and day out. That's why meditation, that's why prayer, that's why our daily walk allows us to continue in that relationship, not to walk away and say, all right, I didn't get what I wanted, but staying in that and keeping those expectations away is how we end up getting filled. It's how we end up becoming not dependent on our own uh, devices to, to get the nourishment or get the things that we want, but how we become uh, or how we are able to trust and rely on the Father to serve us because we've surrendered to him. So there is an invitation. And I'll, I'll invite Ethan up if we want to. Um, I want us to go back to that um, song we did right before communion because it, it really resonated with me that we're welcome at the table. You know, can we come to the table and leave the stuff at the door? And I think we can. I think all of us has the ability to, but it's a matter of also a little bit of in, uh, inward seeking right now of what has been that stumbling block that didn't allow me to fully receive or say yes to that invitation? What are the expectations that I've had, that I've put on God, that I've put on th this transactional relationship between me and God? Because it isn't a transaction. It's eternal life. That's the truth.